Hey, Dr. B, Will Balsowitz, welcome back to the Plant Yourself podcast. Howie, it's a pleasure to be back. I've been really looking forward to connecting and doing this. Yeah, I was just checking my my podcast notes, and we seem to uh, get together every uh, two years. So it was July 2018, May 2020, and and here we are. What is it? June 2022? So um, you know, it's the scary part is like what you've learned in the last two years is probably going to take way more than an hour mm -hmm. to unpack. Well, that's a good thing, right? You know, I mean, I think that I think oh. that. For me, um, it's being in a constant state of learning and progressing forward. I kind of feel like, I don't know how you feel about this, Howie, but I kind of feel like one of the things that troubles me that I see a lot happening in the world is that people sort of decide what their position is and then they dig a trench and sort of defend that position. And, and in fact, I feel like rather than doing that, and this is like more than just nutrition, this is, you know, this is politics or position on different topics. But like, I, I kind of feel like it's actually important for us to um, try to avoid that human tendency, because, you know, like science is constantly evolving. Uh, politics or like, our understanding of the world is constantly evolving. And it's important that we uh, continue to evolve with it. And so like, for me, you know, I, I, there's going to be things I can assure you, there's going to be things that in the future, I'm going to say, you know what, when I said that in 2018, I was, I, I, you know, that was the right call at that time. But now the new call is this. And I think that's the way that we have to move is constantly evolving and adapting. Yeah, that's one of the things that I've really enjoyed about your education and advocacy, the whole the whole movement that you've, you know, created around fiber fueled is your own humility and, and and lack of um it's you know you certainly have passion but you but there's 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 no hatred or anger in it which is actually kind of rare like uh you know we get we say something and then someone attacks us and we double down on it and you know even in your discussions about you know low carb or keto you are you're there's a way in which you're looking for the best in the science and and kind of trying to basically trying to evoke the best in other people it's all it's almost like you know the, you're a big advocate for diversity in general of you know of microbiome of plant-based fiber and also of of you know people and ideas like you're, you're you don't seem to be scared of any uh well i think i think people and ideas are interesting <laughs> right like that's that's what makes the world turn if we all were the exact same person gosh it would be really boring like so boring <laughs> and so those differences like rather than seeing them as a threat which i think is kind of where we're at these days um rather than seeing them as a threat why don't we see them as something that we could be curious about and have a conversation and you know, I also feel like uh, there are many different contexts to things. So sometimes I find that, you know, even my own work, the way that people interpret it, I, I, I sometimes have to step in and say, hold on, like time out. You're, you're, I feel that you may be misinterpreting my work because of the context that you're applying it into. So like as a quick example, <laughs> um, you know, uh, not to weed off with controversy within the plant-based space, but uh, there's controversy surrounding things like, for example, the use of olive oil, right? Mm -hmm, and this mm -hmm. is like a big argument that exists in the plant-based world. And people will say, well, Dr. B, what's your position on this? And my position is very clear, which is that I believe that you, th there are some people I recommend they go oil-free, but generally speaking, I believe that you can be healthy and eat a whole food plant-based diet that includes no oil. I also believe that you can be healthy and eat a whole food plant-based diet that includes some, a moderate amount of oil, olive oil. Um, but like for me, I kind of feel like, why are we fighting about this? Why are we attacking one another when 95% of America is fiber de deficient right now and the average American is 10% plants, 60% processed foods, and 30% animal products. Like, 
arguing over what we perceive to be the utopian diet is so far removed from where we're actually at as a country. We need to start by like actually communicating to these people, the average American who is 10% plant-based. Right. Well, it's, it's a way, I think, I mean, there's all sorts of, you know, sort of um, psychological mechanisms that make us want to associate with a group and um, bond with them by finding common enemies. But there's also, there's also, like what I see you doing is taking responsibility on a very large scale for making people healthier, for making the world, the planet a healthier place. It's it, taking responsibility is kind of a pain in the ass. It's much easier to, you know, just, you know, for me to, to just like complain about a problem or um, announce a utopian solution that will never be achieved than actually do something. You know, I'm in the middle of reading this book called Clean Meat about the, the new, you know, the cellular technology that's trying to produce meat that's not made in laboratories. And my first reaction is, oh, that's terrible. It's a capitalist plot. It's going to terrible bioengineering. And and I really, you know, I recognize all those negatives in myself as, um, you know, sort of knee jerk. And then I think, you know, then I think, well, but is this on the whole going to be better than what we've got? And I think that's part, part of the context that you're always talking about is, well, what are the alternatives? <laughs> right. It's not it's there's no absolutes in the world. There's just this or that better or worse progress or, or stagnation. And like throughout your career, throughout the, the, the four years that I've known you, you have been a consistent advocate for, well, let's let's see if we can make things a little better here. Yeah, I think I think that's I think that's true. And I think that part of it is um, for me uh, um, uh, having an understanding and sympathizing with where people are at because I was in that place. Right. So 10 years ago, like I was that guy who was less than 10% plant based and French fries were my number one plant. <laughs> and, you know, like literally two out of three meals a day were fast food. And the third meal was probably something frozen that I put in the microwave. And um, so, you know, and I, and I was unwell and I was sick. And we've talked about this before. And, and, so your listeners can certainly check out those other podcasts. But, you know, the short is that I was sick. That was 10 years ago. And it was my diet that was destroying my life, destroying my health. And um, I, I, it forced me to step outside the bounds of my education at great institutions, Georgetown, Northwestern, University of North Carolina, to step outside the bounds of my education, to recognize the limitations of my education. And to discover that there's something beyond what I was taught at great medical institutions that I revere, that I celebrate, that I continue to revere and celebrate. And, um, but the problem, you know, the thing, I guess the thing about it, Howie, is that once, as a medical doctor, once you discover that, there is no turning back. Because if you care about your job for the right reasons, then you are looking people in the eye and you know that they're suffering and you know that you have a solution and to ignore the solution, even if it's hard for you to do as a medical doctor, even if it consumes your time, even if it requires you to take home less money to your family, to ignore that solution, recognizing that you have this person sitting across from you who is vulnerable and asking for your help. That to me is like not an option. And so um, that's really where it became sort of a game changer for me. So I, I had in in my notes to ask you about this, like you know how you are different from other GI docs. Are you working off a different evidence set? Um, I guess I want to frame it a different way based on what you just said, which is like, what's the problem where your education at these top notch medical uh, institutions? didn't give you the evidentiary base and the best practices to help your patients the way you're helping them now? Is it just time lag that this is new and in 15 years, everyone will be doing it? But are, are there other sort of systemic obstacles that you see to you just being another doc saying the same thing as all the other docs? Well, I think, first of all, let's start with the good news, the good, you know, rather than me sounding very pessimistic, because I'm about to. 
But um, starting with the good news, the good news is that there is a movement underway. And, you know, just like society continually reinvents itself with younger generations of people who have new and fresh ideas on how things should be done, and they're not always right, but they do push the boundaries and then society moves forward. Um, in the same way, that's happening in medicine right now. The healthcare system has not changed, but there are new generations of doctors who see it differently and they want that change. And where we're at right now in 2022 is that those doctors are forced to personally sacrifice both financially and in terms of the amount of effort that they put into the individual patient encounter, those, those doctors are forced to personally sacrifice in order to make this possible because the system does not support it. But this movement does exist and it's called lifestyle medicine mm -hmm. and it's growing and that's exciting. But, you know, why do we have this problem? This is a multifactorial thing. And I, I you know, you, uh, coming from your perspective, I'm sure we'll have plenty to add to what I'm about to say, but like, I think it starts with, we became seduced with the pill. I think, I think it really comes back, comes to like, let's go all the way back to immediately post world war II, And we just discovered penicillin. And can you imagine how seductive it would be if you just discovered the cure for like the top three causes of death all at once? Hmm. Cause that's what happened. And, um, so then we basically built medical education around the idea that using a pill can like acutely change health outcomes. And that is true. And a pill even today is more powerful than the fork for acutely changing health outcomes when a person is like super sick, right? I'm not going to hospitalize the person and then feed them kale and expect that that's going to kick them out of their ulcerative colitis flare. That would be unreal reasonable. But the problem is that not only did we become seduced by the pill, we empowered the pharmaceutical industry. We built our education around this and medical education. And um, we also uh, bred doctors where this is everything that they were taught. They were not taught otherwise. And the fixation mm -hmm. becomes on the hospital. You know, Howie, my medical training as an internist, so I'm, I'm double board certified. I'm board certified as an internist and a gastroenterologist. Well, my medical training in those two things was like 95% people that are in the hospital, 5% people that are not in the hospital. <laughs> and when you're taking care of the 5% who are not in the hospital, you look at these people and you go, compared to who I got over on the fourth floor over there, you're not sick at all. So why are we even talking right now? Uh -huh. Right? And you completely lose sight of the value of disease prevention. That's the issue. So, but then on top of this, like you lose sight of the value of disease prevention and doctors don't receive it in their medical education. So you're forced to like take a busy human being who's taking call and also has a family and they have to somehow figure out how to like find these new, these this new education on their own. But then in addition to all this, the healthcare system does not support it. So I have never in all of my years of practicing medicine received even one penny through a traditional model for providing dietary guidance. And to have a good dietary conversation takes a minimum of 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. And in today's model, that's an extra patient that you could see for every single person that you counsel on diet. Oh. Very broken. Gotcha. Well, you know, having, having heard that, I'm actually quite optimistic given those structural impediments that we are making the progress that we are. I mean, you've, you're probably coming up on a quarter million books sold. Right. So a bunch of those people are taking your book into their GI docs offices and saying, hey, you know, whatever you've put me on, either it's not working or the side effects are kind of intolerable. What about this? I'm wondering what you're hearing from your profession. 
um, in terms of resistance or gratitude or curiosity? It's a very mixed bag. Um, it's a very mixed bag because I think that there's many different um, phenotypes of doctors. There's some that are very enthusiastic about this and they're like, oh, a like-minded gastroenterologist. This is wonderful. Or, oh, thank you. I'm glad that I finally have a, an, an evidence-based resource that I can actually literally hand to my patient. And it makes the conversation easier for me because I don't have that 15 minutes. So let me have you read this book, right? So like there, there is that and it's awesome. And I love it. Um, I wouldn't say that there are gastroenterologists who are like going at my jugular. I wouldn't say that there's like a negative energy around the work that I'm doing. I think it's more so that they're just like, uh, they're like a horse with the blinders on and mm -hmm. they're looking at their work and they don't even know I exist and they don't uh -huh. know that my book exists and they're not going to take the time to read it or look into it at all. And that's, I would say that's probably the majority of them. Gotcha. Well, so they might be not looking at you, but they are hearing about the microbiome. And, you know, this this organ that didn't even exist 20 years ago in in a lot of, you know, popular, certainly popular, but also medical uh, consciousness. And, you know, I, I, you 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 admitted on the Rich Roll podcast last month to being a math nerd. So I'm, I'm wondering if you've uh, you know, read uh, Gödel Escher Bach or were interested in sort of, you know, the Gödel's incompleteness theorem. Um, it's it seems like the microbiome puts the lie to this the 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 pill um you know the, the pill initiative that that eventually our technology is going to become so great our understanding is going to become so comprehensive that we will solve it with a pill it seems like the microbiome is saying there's something infinite going on here that we cannot manage top down with technology. Yeah, I think that's true. Be well, because um, what's exciting about the microbiome, uh, but also creates its challenges, is the degree of bioindividuality. That if you have two identical twins, like literally they have the same genetic code, the same mom, they grew up in the same household being fed the same meals, right? And these identical twins, if you look under the hood, they only share about 35% of the same microbes. Mm. Mm. So they are more different than they are the same. And um, that speaks to the level of individuality that we have where on a planet of 8 billion people, we don't think that there are any two that are the same in terms of their gut microbiome. Everyone is completely unique. And so to take a pill and because by the way, like we don't normally think of pills this way until you start to really dig into the microbiome, but like the interactions of pills actually, it runs through the microbiome and in many cases involves the microbes. And so when you take a pill, well, that is a generic intervention that is not personalized. That is not individualized. That is a generic intervention. And this explains the microbiome. This explains why when you take a generic intervention and you apply it to perhaps a group of a thousand people, you're going to find that for some people it helps them. For some, re for some people it does absolutely nothing. And for some people they have an adverse effect from it. You get very different outcomes. The very different outcomes are explained by the fact that we have unique biology. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's funny because for a bunch of years, people would throw bioindividuality at me as a reason not to be plant based. Right. So I would, you know, I was you know, writing books with Colin Campbell and Garth Davis and basically saying plant based is the way to go. It's the basic human. And people and, and, and people would attack it by saying, well, but bioindividuality. So I developed an allergy to the idea of bioindividuality. And it's, it's so refreshing to hear you know, again, your inclusive, moderate approach to, well, there's truth everywhere. And, 
like how can we use the understanding of bioindividuality to make people better rather than just sort of score debating points, which is what I was well, trying to do. Well, so the bioindividuality doesn't mean that we that there aren't laws of science or you know rules of biology. Those things exist. It's just that there is a unique way in which our own body receives these rules of these laws. And um, it's interesting, Howie, I actually am working with a company since the last time that you and I connected and, and had a conversation like this. I'm working with a company called Zoe. And Zoe is a personalized nutrition company. And I would argue that we are actually the most advanced personalized nutrition company out there in terms of like taking on the topic of understanding how a person is unique. Mm -hmm. um, and the way that we have done it is that for each individual person, they basically provide their uh, a stool specimen, which gives us their microbiome. So now we have access to 99.5% of their genetic code and we know their microbes and they wear a continuous glucose monitor where basically like around the clock, we are measuring their blood sugar and what's happening there. And then they give us a blood lipid test. And finally, they enter into an app what they're eating. And the way that this works is you put it all into a database. And like if we had 10 people, it would be pretty worthless. But you know, what if you have 10,000 people? Well, we are over 20,000 people now. And that what that allows us to do is to run complex machine learning algorithms that go beyond the sort of population average, you know, because a randomized controlled trial has always been, well, like, what's the average outcome if a person goes plant based? What's the average outcome if a person eats keto? All right, well, what about you, Howie? Like, what if you're not average? <laughs> right? What if you're different than the average? What if like, could you be superior? in terms of your response to a plant-based uh, plant diet? Could you be someone who doesn't necessarily get as much of a response? And that's where using these machine learning algorithms, you can identify trends that apply to the individual using their microbiome, their continuous glucose monitor data and their blood lipid data as sort of the way that we can build the formula and understand mm -hmm. this. Well, but here's the thing. So here's the thing. So I'm saying, you know, okay, so there's a unique response. Okay, but like how much of a unique response? Well, like I, I actually see under the hood, Howie, being the US medical director for this company, I actually see under the hood, what are the personalized recommendations that people receive? And if we're gonna look at like, are we recommending red meat to people over plants? I have never seen that happen. Hmm. Because hmm. at the end of the day, in all cases, for these metabolic outcomes that we're looking at. This is a metabolic product, just to be clear. Um, for these metabolic outcomes that we're looking at, the plants always outperform, right? Um, am I ever going to see that a chicken breast is going to be superior to legumes? I've never seen it happen, right? Mm -hmm. Could it mm -hmm. be that, you know, you do better with lentils than chickpeas and someone else does better with chickpeas compared to lentils? Yes, mm -hmm. that's okay. what I'm talking about. We're just kind of reshuffling things in a minor degree. But, you know, you don't go from being uh, the, at the bottom of the totem bowl all the way up, ratcheted up to the top just because a person is unique. There's general rules. And the general rules say that plants are the superior dietary choice for these outcomes. And it's just a question of, like, what is the order? Right. And you know, so that's another thing, like I have grown up suspicious of subset analysis because, you know, I was I've always seen that used as, well, the pharmaceutical company is trying to figure out some way to save this drug. And so we're going to keep, you know, pea fishing and, and parsing until we find someone we can say, hey, look, we've got a, a statistically significant um, result for this drug. And now, you know, if everyone starts using it off label, well, all the better for, for our uh, stock price. And again, you're saying, well, subset analysis used ethically in the right way can, you know, can provide me a subset of one that can give me some guidance um, that I would never be able to well, figure out. Well, on I think own. this is, to me, this is the um, future of evidence, which is moving beyond. So the randomized control trial 
is intended to be a comparison of a drug versus a placebo. Like that is the origin of the RCT. And the reason why we need that is because when we're talking about bringing a drug to market, if you can't demonstrate efficacy within a population, there's no point in bringing that drug to market. Kill it immediately and move on, right? But when we're talking about food, it's a completely different question because these foods exist at your supermarket and we are all eating some combination of foods. And how do we make choices within these combination of foods, combinations of foods that are better? And so it's a little bit of a different question um, where this is not about like the superior choice among a general population. This is about recognizing that, Howie, I know you eat food, and so do I. How do we identify the right foods for you that are going to reduce, you know, that are going to optimize your metabolism or reduce inflammation or whatever it may be? So, uh, so anyway, I guess the point, the point being that, um, that when we're when we should not apply the rules of randomized controlled trials or drug development, like the, the drug development is its own unique science and it needs to be designed in a way of if we're going to allow a drug to come into market, the benefit has to clearly outweigh the risk. And that is different than saying, what are the foods that you are eating and what are superior choices for you? Recognizing that these foods are already on the market and you're going to have these choices. So how can we take what's available and give you like, you know, sort of a path where you can level up your nutrition by simply making substitutions. Mm. And it, it seems like there's a role for, you know, you mentioned machine learning, like like this this might be a place where so lifestyle medicine and AI kind of come come together to to inform us. Because, you know, like as, as you, you know, you said like ninety nine point five percent of us isn't really us genetically. Like we are these these super organisms, um, you know, and what one one of the points you made on the Rich Roll podcast, and I'll put a link to it because it's, three, you know, almost three hours of some of the best science conversation I've ever heard. So, you know, so, some of the things we're not going to talk about really interesting things because people can just go there and, and listen to that one. But you mentioned that, like, we've been trying to understand this vast, complex universe through our individual brains. And. It's almost like, well, so we need a kind of a super brain. We need a, a more collective consciousness to begin to understand what what wellness is within our own lives and in our communities and on a planetary and cosmic scale. It feels like, you know, just underneath everything you're talking about in terms of science is like a really cool philosophy of life. Yeah, I think you're right, Hallie. I think you're right. And yes, this stuff, it can get intensely complicated, right? I mean, even some of the things that you and I are, are touching on already in this show, it can get intensely complicated. But hold on, time out. Let's slow, th slow this down a little bit and actually zoom out and recognize that digging into the science is complicated but the solutions generally turn out to be quite simple. Mm -hmm. So you can engage with these things. For example, you know, I'm talking about Zoe and personalized nutrition recommendations. You can engage with this in an, in an effort to try to identify ways in which to make substitutions within your diet and level up your nutrition. Is that required to be a healthy human? Absolutely not. We have healthy humans on this planet. Zoe did not exist until 2017 and it never went commercial until 2020. So and we've had healthy humans for a long time. We got the blue zones. And I think that there's a lot, you know, uh, Dan Buettner has become a friend through the years for me. And Dan, of course, is the author of the blue zones and he like immerses himself in the blue zones and he gets to know these people. And science is observation. Science is identifying patterns. And it's not just, you know, epidemiology or randomized controlled trials. There's a lot of different types of science or different ways to observe. And Dan immerses himself in the blue zones. And then he emerges 
And he goes, you guys, you're not going to believe all these centenarians that I've met. They're crazy. They're amazing. They're so happy. They still have a life. Mm-hmm. They have a purpose, right? And it, and it becomes this much more dynamic thing than even just what they're eating. It becomes so much more than that. And you see this pattern that's existing in these five places, and it's just so intuitive. It makes too much sense that when we eat clean, when we eat predominantly plant-based, and we have a purpose, and we are close to our family, and we are socially integrated, we're still like being social and going out and like having a conversation with someone, right? When we have these things that Dan describes in the blue zones, it just makes far too much sense that this is, these are the simple solutions to a healthy life. And then it's like, then I apply my epidemiology techniques to it. And you end up, you know, emerging with epi data that basically says, yes, it is the plants. Yes, it is feeling socially connected. Yes, having a great relationship with your family is important. Yes, like avoiding uh, stressful situations is helpful. Like, it just, it all starts to really make sense where you're seeing these multiple layers of evidence that are all pointing in the same direction towards a simple life that's we're just connected to other humans and we're eating clean food and we're spending time outdoors and we're happy. All right. So, you know, um, among the things I've been interested in since we last spoke um, are psychedelics and indigenous wisdom. And somehow this conversation and your work on, on, um, the microbiome for me is all part and parcel of, of that larger view, which is ba- you know, basically the question is like, who am I? And, and, and what's the difference between who I really am and who my brain thinks I am? Because I don't think of myself as all these microbes, right? Like I am me and that's I have you know, little 38 trillion critters or so crawling all over me, as opposed to I am this conglomeration, <laughs> And my, you know, my identity as a separate being in the universe is pretty, um, you know, ar- an arbitrary cutoff as opposed to I am, I am just part of this energetic and informational flow. Um, I'm not sure what my, what my question is here, ex- except to say that, like, in, in the indigenous stuff that I've read, I don't think any of them would be surprised at your research. Okay. I... Love that this is where we're going. And I don't know that I've ever really talked about this on a podcast before. But um, first of all, you know, there's these traditional forms of medicine, like Ayurvedic, Mm. right? And it's so easy to dismiss Ayurvedic because, again, they're not doing like, you know, complex um, data driven epidemiology studies. And they have different terms or a different vocabulary that they use to describe the same thing. And we may dismiss that vocabulary and say, oh, well, that's like, what are you talking about? The doshas or whatever, right? But they have 6,000 years of experience. And it's not a coincidence that we are now repeatedly discovering using and applying our own vocabulary and terms that they're right that the 6,000 years of observation, they picked up on the patterns of what was going on. And maybe it's not data driven, but it is 6,000 years of evolving wisdom and observation. And so, you know, I think that there is, that is respect for things beyond just like what is in the randomized control trial, having respect for these um, traditions. The other thing, so this is, Interesting. I read the most interesting book the other day. Um, so I'm an avid reader and we have a new baby at home. I don't know if you knew that, Howie. And I'm up every night with the baby oh, oh. feeding her a bottle. Um, I basically take the night shift. Shift. So my wife takes care okay. of the baby during the day okay. so that I can work. And then I'll take the night shift because I am trained in the arts of sleep deprivation. So <laughs> anyway... Um, I'll be up with the baby twice a night. She's she's actually great. She sleeps really well. But I'll be up twice a night with her feeding her a bottle. And I'm like, listen, the book's on tape while I'm feeding her. All right. It's probably not a good idea for sleeping, but whatever. This is what I'm doing. Okay. Forgive me. 
And um, the, I read a book recently called Under the Summer Moon. And it's really the story of the Comanche Indian tribe, which was mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. southwest of the United States, like thinking like Western Texas, New Mexico, um, Arizona, and spread throughout all these areas, Mexico. Well, there was this woman, her name was Cynthia Ann Parker, and she was abducted as a child. She was seven years old. Her family was attacked by uh, Indians during a raid. And um, her family members were killed during this raid and she was abducted. But ultimately she was integrated into the tribe. And then she ended up marrying the chief. She was married to the chief. And th they knew that she was in this tribe and they were searching for her for 30 years. And they found her. Okay, so the settlers, the frontier people, this is like uh, from the 1830s up to the, 18, to the 1860s. They found her and they took her back to society mm. Mm. and she became radically depressed mm. and mm. passed away within a few years. And she constantly fought trying to run away and escape and go back to the Indian mm. tribe. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Uh -huh. And you sit there and you go, they saved her though. They brought her back. How could you possibly be depressed? And then you take a step back and you think about this. She lived in a world that was completely authentic. Where like you had the impulse to dance around a fire until four in the morning and you did that. Where you believed that God or like a higher power was literally everywhere. In the grass, in a rock, in a stream. Where, you know, there... They were constantly like, okay, we are going to move to a new place. They're constantly nomadic, uh, packing up, moving to a new place. And you and you start to realize that there was a romantic there was a romantic element that was very tapped into who we are authentically as humans. And removing her from that, even though she was born and raised and up to seven years old, she was born and raised as a part of normal traditional society. Bringing her back to traditional society actually was was um, something that disrupted her authentic lifestyle that was more tuned into who she really was as a human being. I just thought it was a fascinating story. Mm. And what, what, what do you see as um, sort of in, instructive about that for, for our lives and our health? Well, I think that we, so that, that was the uh, mid 19th century that I'm referring to right now. And, you know, now here we are and it's 2022. And we are born and raised into a society where there's certain rules of how we do things, right? And I see it as we have normalized things that are not very normal. So we are, um, you know, eating food. 60% of the American diet comes from food that didn't exist 100 years ago and an excessive amount of animal products. And yet, like, the, if you watch television channels, it's like the television channels are encouraging us to increase that and go even further on the animal products. And we, uh, we sit on a couch and we watch television at night or during the day. And we have our laptops and we're attached to our laptops and we're addicted to our phone and we're like refreshing our phone, you know, every three minutes because we're curious if something changed. And... It, it just kind of feels like we have been um, pulled into something that actually is very disruptive to who we are as authentic humans. And I'm not saying that we need to live in teepees and have a nomadic lifestyle in order to be happy. But I think what I am saying is that I feel like the disconnect between who we are as humans and who we have become as a society is actually very disruptive and problematic for us from a health perspective and a wellness perspective in terms of the joy and happiness in our life and getting back to something that's a little bit closer to that authenticity. Again, like not saying that we need to actually live out in the wild, but instead just saying that we need to disconnect from our tablets, from our phones, perhaps take a break from the television, not do so much of it, spend more time outdoors, spend more time moving our body, spend more time looking a real human being in the eye rather than looking at them through our phone. And, you know, having a, a meaningful conversation with another person and feeling that human connection um, and eating real food. 
fruits, vegetables, whole grain seeds, nuts, and legumes, things that could be provided at a farm. Um, I think that's, to me, part of the simplicity, but also the motivation and how do we get ourselves to a healthier place is by simply moving back towards, I, I don't want to go so far as to say naturalistic, because that I think is implying that all things that are not natural are inherently bad. And I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that we like, look at how far we have come and changed in such a short period of time. And we're not happy and we're sick. And I know we can do better. Yeah, I mean, when, you know, when I think about the the one um, commonality and all that is really it's really about connection versus separation. That that you know, so there's you know, well, there's a blue zone in Loma Linda, California, that's quite technologically advanced. Nobody there is living in a teepee, but there is a there is a community of obligation, of reciprocity, of of in person connection. You know, you can see it with, with the Amish. You can see it with, you know, Orthodox Jewish communities that deliberately spend a day, you know, crippling their technology. So they have to engage. You see it in the blue zones. And like what I was saying about the, um, like understanding myself as this universe, right? Like Horton, from Horton, here's a who, like I'm, I'm a cosmos. And when the connections are broken there, when when vast swaths of my populations are decimated because of you know the, the meteors or or you know volcanic eruptions in my body that are that are you know reducing biodiversity, um, that's when I'm vulnerable. And you know my my psychedelic experience was like what you know whatever the bio, the biochemistry that turns down the part of my brain that is constantly like defining myself. And being able to be like, oh, I'm I'm no different than the trees and the field and the flowers and the fungus on the flower leaves, um, like those were the those are the moments at which I think, like, healing is a relationship. It's not just a a process that happens when we get the right chemicals in our body. Yeah, I think you're right. I think this is. I think we need to move beyond seeing things as biochemistry and instead see the integration of ourselves into the um, world that surrounds us. And, you know, ultimately it's kind of fascinating to consider that the microbiome ends up becoming some sort of an imprint of the environment in which you live. And all of these factors, you know, uh, ultimately end up like getting distilled down to this is what your gut microbiome is. And then your gut microbiome then becomes this, sort of command center for human health, where this is not to pretend that this is the only thing that matters in your body. But if we're looking at, you know, our digestion, our metabolism, our immune system, our hormones, our mood, our brain health, our energy levels, our genetic code and how it's expressed, the microbiome is um, very, very relevant to each of these things. And these are pretty, mu pretty much the complete list of everything that matters for human health. All right. So I want to make sure we talk about your new book that just came out, the Fiber Fueled Cookbook, um, which which for a while there was was beating out Brene Brown. Congratulations on the the New York Times uh, nonfiction bestseller list. Yeah, thank you. Yes, uh, it's been an exciting ride. Um, the book uh, entered on the list number two in its first week. And which is an appropriate position for a gastroenterologist. I got the good old number two from the New York Times. And um, <laughs> it stayed on the list for a second week. And we are waiting to see what happens in coming weeks. But the book has been performing really well. And I think, I think that a big part of the reason why is because this is a unique offering that has, I, I don't believe has ever existed within the the sort of reading market, which is that, yes, it is a cookbook. It has 125 recipes and full color photography, like beautiful food photos. But actually, this is far more than a cookbook. Like I, I honestly didn't even know what the right term was in terms of what you call this, because it also has 11 chapters. And those 11 chapters are sort of guiding people step by step through a process that they can take 
in order to in order to heal their gut if they need to heal their gut in order to overcome food intolerances if they need to overcome food intolerances or if you're someone who's healthy well you know we've already mentioned that your gut is connected to so much that matters for human health and so this is a very precious commodity and uh, to me it's like the last thing that you would want to just neglect and hope it turns out okay um, it should be something that we actually have a, a, a game plan and are intentional about in terms of nurturing. Because when we do that, then we are setting ourselves up for the greatest success possible in terms of our health. And um, so, you know, the book is for that person as well, because ultimately, not only is this about healing or fixing problems, this is also about optimizing and Every single recipe is built with gut health in mind. There's new elements that people are probably missing. That's that to me is what, you know, I sort of, this, this is the how, and my first book was the why. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll, there's a bunch of things I really love about this book. And so, you know, one, one thing I'll, I'll say is, you know, I had a little mix up with your with your PR team. They didn't send me the book at first. So then I got, they sent it to me and you sent me a copy on the same day. And I'm so glad because one of them lives in my office as a health reference, and the other lives in my kitchen with my cookbooks. Like, it would be it would be hard to only have one copy just for, for me professionally. So you know, so like what I was thinking when I was looking through it is like every other cookbook I have is more or less recreational, and this is really functional. Like the recipes here are. Uh, the tools for the, the the workbook process that you lead us through almost almost as if you were our doctor and we you know you're asking us questions do I have this is this my issue what about this um, and then given our answers and given our food journal the recipes are then things we can plug in to a very rational linear process um, to maximize our chances of getting better. So I just, I just love that organization. I was, I was one, wondering if that's how you thought about it as you were creating the book. Well, the, 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 the way that this book came to be, to be completely honest with you is that, so, um, put yourself in my shoes for a moment. I was working full time as a medical doctor. I was taking call literally 24 out of every 72 hours. And, um, and I have a young family. And Fiber Fueled comes out and I am completely overwhelmed because the amount of attention that you receive as an author is proportional to the number of people who are reading your book. There have been over 200,000 people at least who have read Fiber Fueled. And so um, a couple months into it, my publisher is like, look, we want more, we want more Dr. B books. And I said, I don't know if I can do that. I'm burnt out. I'm tired. I don't know if I have it in me. You know, I put my, I put it on the line for this book. This was a passion project. I wanted to do it. I wrote it at five in the morning. I made great sacrifices to make this possible. And so the deal that we worked out was I'm going to do a cookbook. And I thought, okay, cool. This will be easy. I'll just have, uh, you know, Alex Caspero who did the recipes for fiber field. I'll bring her on board, have her do a bunch of recipes and someone will take some photos and I will write uh, six paragraphs and we'll call it a day. And, but then <laughs> as um, I moved into 2021, I started to prepare the book and it became clear to me that this was an opportunity, a unique opportunity to create a tool for healing where people reach out to me. And this is to me, I know you know this. It's a huge problem in the in the plant based world that people reject a plant based diet on the grounds that it exacerbates digestive health problems. And this is my responsibility as a gastroenterologist. This is what I've been taking care of and helping people with behind closed doors for years. How do we fix that problem? Right? We can't just have them. Uh, going to YouTube or whatever it may be and saying, veganism sucks. It ruined my gut. It wrecked my gut. That's what they say. That's not actually true. Second of all, you need someone like me. I don't expect you to know how to fix this on your own. 
you need someone like me to help you through that process. So it became an opportunity, Howie, to create a healing tool. And um, I started writing in January of 2021. And then I had a breakthrough in like late February, early March. So I'd been writing for like five or six weeks. And I had a breakthrough where I, it hit me. Here's this word that is so relevant to my uh, platform and in my community. And I already talked about it a lot in my first book, Fiber Fueled. The word is growth, having a growth mm -hmm. mindset, which of course I did not invent. Carol Dweck introduced this idea in 2006. But having a growth mindset, well, I can use that as the acronym. And it's a step-by-step -step healing process. And when I discovered this, growth, G-R-O-W-T-H, here's what this stands for. I'm just going to move quickly through this. G stands for genesis. What is the root cause of your problem? You have to start there. That's the first step. You For every, for every healthcare encounter, it should always start with this, whether, you're, whether it's with me or, or anyone. What is the root cause of your problem? Then R-O-W, these three letters, they are in combination, uh, restrict, observe, work it back in. This is how you identify your food intolerances. So there is no blood test or poop test or hair test to tell you what you are intolerant to. You need to follow these steps, restrict, observe, work it back in, and then you can actually figure out truly what foods you are intolerant to. And once you do, then you can T, train your gut. Your body is intensely adaptable. We know this because people can actually run marathons. They train their body to do a marathon. People train their body in the gym. Well, your gut is more adaptable than your muscles are. You can train your gut to be adapted to new dietary choices or to foods that you don't think that you can tolerate. You can actually train your gut to do it. So we do that. And then the last letter H is perhaps my favorite. It's holistic healing. And it's coming back to what you were talking about with sort of the psychedelics or the integration that we have with the entire world is to say that you are not just a digestive system. You are a complete human being. And that complete human being needs to be lifted up, needs to be healed. And the way in which we do that is sometimes to step outside of the digestive system and to heal the things that are holding you back, like, for example, trauma. So anyway, uh, this G-R-O-W-T-H, the growth strategy, which is sort of, it became the backbone for the book. And when I had this um, revelation, I immediately emailed my literary agent and my publisher and I said, I just had a breakthrough. And I'm discarding the first six weeks of writing, I'm discarding it, and I'm starting over. But this is going to be awesome. And that became the book. I love the fo the G, right? Because like that's one of the sins that I've seen in the plant based movement is, well, like eat plants and you'll get better, and if you don't, I don't want to hear about it because you're threatening my worldview. Like there there was a couple of years where like I didn't want to hear about FODMAPs because that's like oh that's just going to get people not to eat plants. Like I don't even I want to you know la 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 stick my fingers in my ears. And, you know, you have two really important chapters on FODMAPs and histamines and saying, like, let's actually figure out what's going on. And there's there is just, I can't remember where where I read it, but basically, um, you know, the. The most vulnerable place to come from is pride, because right? then you constantly have to defend, whereas you're saying, like, let's we don't know. Let's find out. Let's. Let's look at the science, let's explore, and let's put it to the test in your own N of one to see what's what's going on. And so could you talk a little bit about uh, FODMAPs and histamines and what what they are and why plant-based people should not be afraid of exploring their effects and possible negative effects on us? Well, I mean, not only should plant-based people not be afraid of exploring these foods, but, uh, you know, let's... Let's look at the average person in the United States who is 10% plant-based and 
their reason for not going plant-based is many times, well, I don't feel well when I eat that way. And so I'm creating a mm -hmm. bridge that allows all of these people to step onto the bridge and move towards progress and better health and overcoming these restrictive limit, limiting factors through a process, like through certain steps that you can take. And so, so what are these things? Well, we're talking about food intolerances. Food intolerances basically means that a food that you are consuming is causing some sort of symptoms that you don't want. And uh, food intolerances are not inherently dangerous, but they do negatively affect our quality of life. In both of these cases, the gut microbiome takes center stage. FODMAPs are the fermentable carbohydrates in our food. And that includes lactose and dairy okay. products, but it also includes, you know, like different forms of uh, essentially fiber in beans and in garlic and in whole grains or like fructose and fruit. Well, the reason why people struggle with FODMAPs in most cases is because they are prebiotic. So what's interesting about prebiotic foods is that um, prebiotic foods are actually the foods that we depend on our gut microbiome the most to process and digest. So that includes fiber and that also includes these FODMAPs. And so it's an interesting um, uh, paradox in a way, which is that the the foods that we need the most to support a healthy gut microbiome, meaning the prebiotics, turn out to be the foods that we may struggle the most with if you have a damaged gut. So, but there's an entire way that we can work through this. And unfortunately, what people have been doing for the last, you know, 10 years is closing themselves off in restrictive dietary patterns, eliminating different foods, thinking, oh, I'll just go low FODMAP, eliminate all high FODMAP foods, and just stay this way. And the problem is that when you do that, you're eliminating the prebiotics, and your gut actually becomes weaker in the process. So the solution is actually the reintroduction of these foods and we just need a systematic way in order to ha in order to accomplish that. Um, and that's part of what I'm teaching with. There's a, an entire protocol, including 30 recipes and a chapter explaining the details and the step-by-step -step process in the book. With histamines, histamine is an important uh, and interesting topic because, so first of all, histamine is a signaling molecule that exists within our body. Um, I have histamine in my bloodstream literally right now. So do you. But like anything else, if it falls out of balance, it can become problematic. One of the ways that it can fall out of balance is through our diet. Where okay. our food may contain large amounts of histamine. We don't realize that. And then we ingest this large amount of histamine and it starts basically like activating all the histamine receptors throughout our entire body. And it can present in very interesting ways because this goes beyond just your digestive system. This actually is a whole body thing. And this is part of the reason why our healthcare system has struggled with this topic. Because when something affects more than just one specialty, <laughs> then patients <laughs> largely lose their advocates other than perhaps their primary care doctor. You know, most doctors are like, well, I'm here for your bloating. That's me. I'm here for your bloating, but you'll have to see an allergist for your runny nose and you have to see a neurologist uh -huh. for your headache, right? So, well, anyway, with histamine intolerance, when you consume these high histamine foods, and by the way, for people who are curious, here's what, here's a couple of them. So um, in the animal product space, fish and shellfish are like the top ones. Um, fermented foods in general are extremely high in histamine. Uh, that includes vinegar and alcohol and chocolate, and that also includes fermented dairy products. And then in the plant space, there's really four main high histamine foods, and they are spinach, tomatoes, eggplant, and 
pains me to say it, but avocados. All right, those are the four. Uh-huh. So when you eat these foods, if you have histamine intolerance, you could manifest many different symptoms. Here's the key for the listeners who are with us right now. The question for you is, do you have two of what I'm about to describe? Because if you have two, I'm going to tell you what to do next. But the symptoms may be gas and bloating. That's the number one symptom of histamine intolerance, gas and bloating. Um, Nausea, acid reflux, abdominal discomfort, abdominal cramping, diarrhea, constipation, but then also outside the gut, starting up top, headache, migraine, um, uh, runny nose, sinus issues, chronic sinusitis, cough, dry cough, sore throat, uh, rapid heartbeat, funny heartbeat, uh, palpitations, uh, lightheadedness, rash, eczema, hives, flushing, uh, uh, painful menstrual cycle, fatigue, insomnia. Um, okay, there we go. So <laughs> if, you, if you have two of those, right, like almost everyone does, okay. right. that doesn't prove that you have histamine intolerance. But what it says is this could be histamine intolerance. What if it is histamine intolerance? How do we prove it? Well, there's no blood test. There's no blood test. There's no poop test. There's no CAT scan. Ultimately, you have to eat a low histamine diet. Mm-hmm. And, and because there's no test, it's not likely something that doctors are going to be looking for. Well, so the test is the low histamine diet. If you just have generalized health problems and you go for a checkup, it doesn't seem like histamine is a topic that comes up. They're going to do, you know, a, a CBC. They they might, you know, do a lipid panel. They might ask you about, you know, you know, like, but but like histamines is not doesn't seem like it's it's on the po- sort of popular consciousness as a potential cause. Right. It's not going to be, and it's not that it doesn't exist. Tell the people who do a low histamine diet and their hives go away and their migraines improve, you know, tell them that this is nonsense. It's not, it's real. But the problem is that it's not able to, where we are, if you don't have an actual test, it's not able to insert itself into uh, our current state of healthcare that is so time constrained and requires doctors to basically like, you know, with a knee jerk, flip out an order for some tests and some imaging and then move on to the next patient, right? So it, mm-hmm. it's that issue does not change whether or not histamine intolerance exists, whether or not people benefit from a low histamine diet, whether or not this could be life tra- transforming for you. None of that changes. It's all the same. The problem is that your the healthcare system is not going to be able to do this. And ultimately what you need, Howie, is you need a doctor to hand you a stack of recipes. And that's never happened in the history of medicine or very rarely in the history of medicine has that ever happened. Until like now, this is the beauty of the book is that I can create a book and I can hand you a stack of recipes. Here's 26 low histamine recipes. And you quite simply follow this dietary mm-hmm. pattern for two weeks. And then you report back to me, did your symptoms improve? And if the answer is yes, right. then we have empowered you. Right. And what I love about it is that like I could imagine a company coming up with like the low histamine bar, right? And just, okay, eat these for 21 days. And then that's easy. I could prescribe it. Maybe I could get it as a medical, you know, I get reimbursed or you could, whatever. But it's still highly restrictive. You've created a chapter that is, in a sense, restrictive, but in another sense, incredibly inclusive. Like if you just make a bunch of these different recipes, again, you're going to get a huge variety of plant fiber without the histamine. Well, and that's that's the that's one of the important points from this chapter is that, so first of all, it, it's not just recipes. It's actually the education and empowerment that's necessary for people to understand the process of healing. And this is an issue that can be overcome. And the goal is not to start a low histamine diet and stay on a low histamine diet. The goal is to use the low histamine diet temporarily to identify the presence of this issue and then to heal from it and get back to enjoying those foods like sauerkraut. And so 
how do we do that? Well, a big part of that, Howie, is that people who have histamine intolerance, they have a damaged gut. One of the big parts of this story is that they have a breakdown of the gut barrier. And as a result of that, we call it increased intestinal permeability, but on the internet, they call it leaky gut. It makes it a lot easier mm -hmm. for the histamine in your diet to basically enter into your bloodstream. So how do we fix leaky gut? The answer is fiber. Dietary fiber comes Beauty through the context, right? right? Yeah, exactly. So di dietary fiber co connects with your microbes. The microbes turn it into butyrate. And butyrate, one of the short chain fatty acids, has been shown to actually fix increased intestinal permeability. It's shown to actually repair the gut barrier. So, well, the beauty, the beauty of it is this. Like, you're not just eating low histamine. You're eating low histamine, high fiber designed for healing. It, it kind of reminds me of when I was working in, in uh, online marketing, that one of the things that would get my clients into trouble when I was teaching them how to get more internet leads was they would all of a sudden have a really successful campaign and get all these leads and they did their sales force couldn't handle it. And, you know, they would be overwhelmed they wouldn't know, they wouldn't be able to convert, the morale would be low, people would get yelled at, people would get fired. As, and it was almost like, oh, the leads are the problem, right? It's almost like these foods, like what you want, they, they're exactly what you want, but if you don't have the infrastructure to handle them, then they're gonna end up looking like a, a problem rather than the actual solution. Right, exactly, when in fact they are the solution, right? And it's, well, it's kind of like this. Uh, I like to use an exercise analogy or a rehabilitation analogy. Pretend you hurt your knee, right? If you hurt your knee, well, mm -hmm. ultimately your goal is not to be completely devoid of pain. Yes, that is a goal. But truly your goal is to restore function to your knee because you don't want to yeah. be stuck in a position where you're not able to use your leg anymore. And so now if the goal was exclusively the absence of pain at all costs, you would simply retire to the couch and never move again. And if you never put weight on your knee, you would not feel pain. But then your leg grows weaker, your body grows weaker, your metabolism falls out of balance and new health issues start to arise. It makes no sense. Why would you do that? Instead, you go through a rehabilitation process. It's step by step. You are challenging your knee incrementally over time. But when you do these challenges, you do run the risk that there may be some discomfort. Not that you're just going to, you know, take all the pain, but instead it's just that we're trying to control the pain as much as, much as we can, but there might be some. Yeah. in that healing process. But over time, these incremental challenges, they progress what your knee is capable of. And as it progresses, you are restoring functionality until eventually you reach a point where the functionality is completely restored. And there is no pain. And you're back to playing tennis or playing basketball. You have no restrictions. And that's the healthiest version of yourself. And that's where you want to be. And that's exactly the way that we're treating the gut or we need to treat the gut, which is that the solution is not restriction. Restriction makes you weaker. That's like laying on the couch. The solution is mm -hmm. understanding the process of rehabilitating to incrementally challenge your gut so that you can restore the function to get back to that place where there is no limitation. Right. And as someone I've, I've spent the past month rehabbing a, a plantar fascia tear. Um, and, you know, so definitely after, you know, the, like the first week, no weight whatsoever, just, you know, babying it in a boot and crutches and then gradually increasing the challenge. And some things are working and some things are not right. Like the pain is now my teacher in terms of what I should be doing to rehab, how hard, how intense, how frequently. Um, so that ultimately, you know, the, the pain is not something to avoid at all costs, but something to pay attention to as a, as a means of growing my wisdom. 
around maintaining function. Well, that's an important point, right? Because um, in these settings that we're referring to, whether it's re re rehabbing your knee, recovering from a plantar, plantar fascia tear, which is very painful, um, or uh, rehabilitating your gut, it's not, I think it's best to not view pain as this catastrophically negative thing that exists. I'm not saying that you want it, but let's reframe this. Pain is feedback from your body. Your body is identifying the boundaries for you. And you just need to acknowledge the boundary that exists identified by that pain threshold and maintain yourself below that boundary. But then the boundary will escalate as you continue to challenge and re-challenge your body. And that's, so that's you, seeing it as feedback as opposed to this like negative thing that serves no purpose other than to inflict harm on you. I think seeing it as feedback is an important part of this process of healing. Yeah, and I'm thinking about, um, you know, sub pain or some kinds of discomfort um, as signals that we probably most of us ignore. Again, we're on our you know tablets or phones while we're eating or, or doing something or watching something or reading something, and you know like yeah, by the time someone comes to see you, they've got some full blown forest fire raging inside them. But like there are times when I, I'm going to just eat something mindfully and realize that I don't want it. That oh, it's, it's you know it's just like not right in my mouth or I, I'm starting to feel a little bloated or uncomfortable. And I'm wondering if, if you if you have found that you or your family or patients by bringing mindfulness to the eating process can avoid mistakes as opposed to two days later, oh, my, you know, this is happening. I'm constipated. I have diarrhea. So I've, I've had a reaction that I didn't notice in the moment. Like, can can we become sensitive to food in that way? Well, I, I, I have not seen a study and it's a little bit hard to prove because, you know, the question becomes, can an individualized intuitive approach lead people to better health outcomes? And I haven't seen a study to prove this, but I do believe that it's true. I do believe that we were blessed with a brain that has the capacity to identify patterns that we like versus not like. Quick example. <laughs> so I am terrified of snakes. Mm -hmm. My wife is not scared of them at all. My wife, if you told her a snake is not poisonous, she will go out there and she'll pick up the thing and hold it. Okay. Yeah. Yesterday, I walk out into the garage with my son and I see something moving in the corner. And I look and there's a rat snake. Now the rat snake is not poisonous. My wife says, I go, babe, there's a snake in the garage. Oh my gosh. And my wife goes, oh, I'll, I'll go out and I'll, I'll pick it up. No big deal. You walk out and the snake is coiled back, lifting its head up, not quite like a cobra, but like kind of, it's, it's basically like in a position that you can tell if you step within two feet of the snake, it is reaching out to strike you. Yeah. Yeah. Now I have never seen a snake in this position in my entire life, Howie, but I knew exactly what that snake was trying to tell me. And I uh -huh. wasn't going to cross that line. And my wife was like, I just want to pick I'm like, no, babe, we're going back inside and we'll check back in a couple hours and hopefully the snake is gone. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, and I, and by the way, um, rat snakes are a healthy part of a healthy ecosystem. So even though I hate snakes, I, I, I actually am very happy that we have a snake, a rat snake that lives around our house. But, you know, but the point yeah, being probably better than rats. Well, that's, that's exactly right. They help to protect, they help to keep balance within the ecosystem. Right. And they will help to maintain the populations of those rats. So, uh, anyway, the point being though, is that like, I, I do believe that with our food, our body has the capacity to identify patterns but I think the, the one exception to this is that we have to be smart enough, again, to recognize that discomfort is not the end all be all in terms of human health. 
that many great things mm -hmm. are accomplished by having a process to overcome discomfort rather than to withdraw away from it. And that includes exercise, that includes rehabilitating an injury, and that includes optimizing your gut function. Mm, I love that. And, you know, what comes to me is, you know, from a psychological perspective, so like, we, you know, basically we operate based on emotions interacting with our environment, telling us what to do, you know, move this way, move that way, eat this, mate with that, you know, like everything sort of becomes like our, our operating instructions are basically these base emotions. And we go wrong when our emotions are stuck in, in sort of stuck past patterns. So, you know, if I have daddy issues, every time I meet a man, I could like play out a daddy thing, you know, despite the fact that, you know, you're not my daddy, you never were, right? Like, um, right, or when I was a kid, my mom gave me chocolate when I was sad. And so now I eat chocolate because it makes me feel better, even though it might make me feel worse. This is speaking to the complexity, not just of our gut microbiome, but also the human body, the human mind, that the majority of our mind, you know, you mentioned psychedelics are earlier, like, so what's what's going on there? And, you know, I feel that what's happening is we are breaking down the boundary that exists between the conscious mind and the non-conscious mind is what happens in that kind of setting. Mm -hmm. And the non-conscious mind is something that you don't have the capacity to have complete control over, yet it can be so relevant to the way that your body functions. And this includes exposure to traumatizing events. So, and trauma can be very much a point of uh, relativity in the sense that it's, it, it's individualized is what I'm saying is, is that, you know, I can't tell you what qualifies as trauma. You have to tell me on an individual basis, is this traumatizing to you? Because if it is unsettling and it is disturbing you, whether that's in your conscious mind and you are capable of acknowledging it or whether it is something that you have not acknowledged, but it is there and it's in your non-conscious mind. Either way, what it does is it activates certain pathways within your body, which are the stress response. And it starts in the pituitary gland and it runs through a hormone called corticotropin releasing hormone. Just, just explaining the physiology of what you're talking about, Howie. You activate this pathway through corticotropin releasing hormone, CRH. And the CRH triggers a cascade of physiologic responses in your body that is your stress response but the compromise if you follow it downhill is that at the bottom of the waterfall you have inflicted injury to your gut so you're forced to make this trade-off mm -hmm. and you know that trade-off was an acceptable trade-off when you're trying to preserve your life because you're being attacked by a saber-toothed tiger but that trade-off is problematic when it is a perpetually activated perpetually activated stress response because there is something in your life that is troubling you or disturbing you that has not adequately been healed. And this is something that exists outside of your gut. But because of these connections between your brain and your gut, the manifestation, the physical manifestation actually is in your gut. And then you think you have a gut health problem, but you never really get better. And this comes back to the last letter mm -hmm. in the growth strategy, which is holistic healing, looking at the complete person and looking for opportunities to heal beyond the boundaries of the digestive system. Yeah, that's, that's so beautiful. And, and what it does, it, it frames, you know, the negative as, a, as an opportunity, right? Like everything <clears throat> that is, we're suffering from is a doorway to walk through towards healing, even, you know, like people who pick up your book may not think they're going to heal their hearts, you know, their souls, but like going through the process and saying, okay, where, where am I stuck in trauma? Where, where have I not metabolized or processed the past so that I'm free in the present? Like these are, these are all doorways for like a fully uh, lived life, not not just a life free of, you know, farting and bloating and, you know, constipation. Well, you know, uh, I'm not trying to pretend that life is this easy, you know, uh, thing that, you know, just suck it up and fix your problems. 
Um, I think we all face challenges in your in our lives. But I also do think this is just my perspective. You know, what I have discovered through my life is that many times the things that I think are the worst moments for me, where I feel like I'm being cursed, in in many cases actually prove to be blessings. And mm-hmm. um they motivate me to become a better version of myself. So 10 years ago, I was curled up in a ball in a dark room by myself and depressed and had health issues. And in that moment, you say, why are you doing this to me? And Mm -hmm. that actual encounter is what motivated me to become the doctor that I am today, and the author of these two books. And so I do think that there is this element where the challenges that we face during our life can become uh, sources of greater opportunity or or propel us to becoming better versions of ourselves in a way. Yep. And I I love that your, your general attitude of, you know, context that there's, there's, we're not, you're not creating a world of dietary heroes and villains. It's not like, you know, you're not writing for, for the Marvel Cinematic Universe where you have to decide, you know, avocado, a hero. Well, yeah, you have a whole, you know, two page spread on avocado toast. And avocados in this context might not be such a great idea that, that this idea that the world is like complex and lush and full. And, and that's a blessing like that. I think that allows us to to feel safe that moments of pain aren't necessarily the worst thing that could be or that that moment of yours, that dark night of the soul could be the soil in which a, a beautiful seed starts to grow. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, uh, I think that there is I, I, I think that at the end of the day, um, to have a day of life is a beautiful and precious thing that could easily be taken for granted. And opening our eyes to the beauty that exists in the world, the beauty that exists in other people, you know, um, there's assholes out there and we all have to deal with them. I, I have a 2% yeah. rule. I'm of the belief that anytime I do anything, because there's so many people now who are engaged with my work, I'm of the belief that 2% of them are always going to tell me that I'm the worst human being on the entire planet for what I do. But, um, (laughs) but, but, but like, why waste your time focusing on those on that 2% when you could focus on the 98% that are happy to be there with you. And so, so I do think Mm -hmm. that like, this is, you know, I think it's just a matter of sort of seeing those opportunities that exist in the world and to navigate with the proper mindset that allows you to find joy in the things and to have these negative things that happen and to the best of your ability to move beyond them. Yeah. And, and you, you of all people should know that assholes also have an important function. So... so. <laughs> So before we go, tell tell me a little bit about Zoe and like you made a major, you know, life career shift and what's what's your vision for the contribution you'd like to make there? Well, uh yeah, my 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 career has dynamically changed in a very powerful way. Um, you know, I guess the short of it first of all is that I left my medical practice a few months ago and part of that was the realization that even though I consider myself to be a hard worker, I think the people who like follow me, they can, you can see that I'm a hard worker. But um, when you're a hard worker in your 20s, it's a choice that you make and it only affects you and that's your choice. Mm-hmm. When you're in a hard worker in your 40s, you have a family and those choices affect your family and that can be unfair. Um, so mm-hmm. I made the realization that I had my full-time job as a medical doctor and I had this full-time job as an author slash, you know, uh, public, uh, figure and educator and I'm a dad 
and I deeply care about my family and that something was going to give whether I like it or not. And if I tried to sustain both of those careers, that the thing that would be giving would be my family. So I made the choice to um, pursue a higher goal, a higher mission, which is to use my education, my experience to try to impact more people and still in a very powerful way rather than less people in a powerful way. And mm -hmm. um, so I've moved into this new phase where I'm focusing more on doing things more as a, an author, public figure, and educator. Um, but part of this is that I've also had a maturing relationship with this company, Zoe, that I've been involved. I've been involved with them since 2020 on their scientific advisory board. And we spoke earlier about what Zoe is, so I'm not going to really rehash that other than to say that I, I, I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't believe in it. Um, uh, I have a lot of choices in terms of where I invest my time and what I do with my time. And I am not uh, motivated by dollars and cents. I'm motivated by impact and the ability to change lives. And what we are building is, I think, a company that is going to allow us to, for the first time, truly tap into that unique biology um, in an evidence way, evidence-based way. I mean, we are publishing in the top scientific journals, our findings. We're not hiding anything and we are pretty much as academic as you could be as a commercial entity. Uh, but we are basically moving towards understanding that. And I think the future is very bright. I think we're just touching the tip of the iceberg. Um, and so you know, I, I'm I'm honored and privileged to be a part of it as the U.S. medical director, and, and to be a big part of like helping make make this possible. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I can see this the the smile and the energy behind it. It's beautiful. It's beautiful to see you, you know, landing on a spot that allows you to uh, to ha to to be a dad and husband and to to keep pursuing your mission in this way. Um, for our for the, for those of us who are interested, who have been following you for years and trust you in your work, like what does Zoe have to offer us? What 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 should we know about it, and should how do we get involved? Well, Zoe, so the the proposition is this: um, we are demonstrating the ability to take information that we can collect over the period of a little over a week. Uh, including your microbiome, your your blood lipids, your blood sugar, and what you're eating, we've we've demonstrated the ability to provide you with personalized recommendations on how to level up your nutrition. And it's really designed to make your engine run clean, make your mm -hmm. engine run as smooth as possible. We are a metabolic um, product as as we stand today. Now. Part of what's cool and exciting about how we're doing this, you have to understand, I, I think you get this, Howie, but the average person doesn't spend a lot of time thinking about this. The NIH budget keeps getting smaller. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The NIH is not paying for stuff like this. And, you know, if you are only allowing big pharma to do research, then all we're going to get are drug trials and more pills. <laughs> And so what we have created here is a framework that we call citizen science. Now, we are not the first to do this, but I believe that we will be the biggest to do this. It's called citizen science. And effectively what this means is that like Howie, when you participate, you're not just getting a benefit for yourself. You are, but you are also contributing to the greater benefit for society. It allows us to do this large scale clinical study with, you know, we have over 20,000 people now, and then we'll be at a hundred thousand and then we'll be at a million people. And this information is all being used to publish papers that are publicly available. Anyone can read them to push forward science and for the people who participate to provide them with individualized feedback on how to optimize their body. Mm -hmm. So that concept of citizen science is basically we're pushing new boundaries and it has to, the finances have to come from somewhere in order to do it. The grants are never going to pay for it. 
pharma is never going to pay for this. Pharma is not interested in nutrition because it's not a pill. So if we want the biggest nutrition study in the world, which is what we're doing, we need individual people to basically sign up and say, I'm willing to help contribute. I'll contribute my microbiome. I'll contribute my data. I'll chip in some money. And yes, I will also receive important information back, but I also would be helping everyone else. That's kind of what mm-hmm, we, the mm-hmm. way that we look at it. Gotcha. So, I mean, the idea of publicly available research is a big deal, right? So I don't have to pay $49 for a PDF from Elsevier or somewhere or, uh, you know, go, go to Sci-Hub, whatever, whatever country they happen to be operating in now to, to, um, to break through the, the paywall. Um, but that's, you know, like scientific publishing, which like a lot of studies that are paid for with my tax dollars, I can't read as a member of the public beyond the abstract. Totally. And, and, and also, uh, again, like the science never happens in the first place unless we, unless we create a framework to actually do it. Right. So these studies that we have, you know, we've published in nature medicine twice so far in the last two years. Well, this is literally the top journal on the planet. We've published Mm -hmm. in nature Mm -hmm. endocrinology. We've published in gut. Like we, we are adding to our understanding of how the body works where anyone, whether you're a part of Zoe or not benefits from this because we're advancing the science. And so that's, you know, that, that's one of the, um, the things is like, I would challenge people when you look at Zoe, this is what I love about it is, um, we, st- we formed the company in 2017. I didn't even know they existed in 2017. You know why? Because they were busy doing a clinical trial for three years. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now they could have come straight to, straight to market with a product immediately. They could have done that and applied marketing techniques and told you that they have something special. But instead, they spent three years conducting clinical trials to demonstrate that their product actually works while their competitors were selling their product to you. That's the integrity, mm-hmm. integrity, that's the honesty, that's being transparent. And I would challenge people when you're looking at stuff like this, show me the science, right? If you're this big company, where have you published your findings? What do you have to prove that your product works? And what have you done with all this money that you've made to contribute to scientific understanding or to help us be better? And what you're going to find the majority of the time is they have done nothing. So, so when I um, sign up for Zoe and I pay money and I get a kit in the mail and I, I guess I poop in a box and I go to a lab and I fill out a, an app, a food questionnaire, what, what's, my, what's the product that I get back? Is it a list of foods to eat or avoid? Is it a recipes? Is it... So everything that you do, you do at home. Um, so that includes like, you don't have to go to a lab. Even the blood testing is actually, you, uh, do like a blood drip. Like you do like five drops of blood onto a card and that takes care of it. Um, and you do, so there's sort of different phases to how this works. The first phase is that you sign up and you receive your kit and you are providing the information. And until Zoe Mm -hmm. receives that information and analyzes it, they're not going to give you feedback yet that is individualized. They may give you some general, you know, education, like there's an app and within the app, you will be receiving education so that you're already sort of primed and ready. And then your results come and your results will come initially in a PDF where it'll be a full breakdown of like, what is your blood sugar response? What is your blood lipid response? What's up with your gut microbiome? And this, this PDF is like, I'm not exaggerating when I say probably 65, 70 pages, giving you the full breakdown of everything that's going on there. After that, you open the app back up and the app has changed. Now the app is no longer about collecting your information. Now the app is about providing you with feedback. Mm-hmm. Every single mm-hmm. food, you can like literally see what your personalized score is and you can prove that it's a personalized score because if you have a friend who also does zoe you open up your apps and you will see that they are different 
And so within that personalized score, it helps you to frame, okay, like what is my, what are the foods that I should be leaning towards? And what are the foods that maybe I've been eating a lot of? And in no way are we saying eliminate, but what we are saying is see and understand what is good for your biology. Lean into the foods that are good and then moderate the foods that are not. Make them more of a once in a while thing as opposed to an everyday thing. So you get these lists, like for example, I have my gut boosters. And there's a list of 15 foods that are my gut boosters specifically for me. Now, what category of food did my gut boosters come from, Howie? What do you think? Well, I'm assuming uh, plants. Exactly. All plants. So all. So again, it comes back to, it doesn't matter what your biology is, your gut boosters are going to be plants because this is where the fiber and the polyphenols and the resistant starches, which are the prebiotics, this is where they exist. Flip side, gut detractors. What are the ones that are not helping your gut microbiome be healthy? Well, that may include some plant foods in the sense that like uh, a, a candy is a plant food, right? Mm -hmm. An Oreo mm -hmm. is a plant food. So you may have some of those in there. They're not whole plants. And then you're, you're going to have like the, you know, animal products like red meats, processed meats, et cetera. So uh, the point being though, that ultimately this helps to frame sort of the um, if we think about nutrition as being a hierarchy, this is actually, rather than speculating on what the hierarchy looks like and debating it, we're, we're actually assigning numbers, and those numbers are determined by your unique and individual biology. Sure. And does it shift over time? Because I guess you're, you're only doing the monitoring once, but like your book is all about you know, phase one, these might not be so great, but phase two and three, you want to reintroduce them. How, do, how does the, the app capture that, dy that dynamic uh, potential for growth? So uh, this is a great question. We are, again, a very young company because we launched our product for the first time in the United States less than two years ago. And we are evolving. So part of what we're doing is preparing for retesting. As currently conceived, people who do Zoe, they are provided recommendations based upon that initial round of testing. In the future, like, and I don't know if this is going to be second half of 2022 or early 2023, but this is the kind of time frame that we're talking about here. In the future, people will have the option to retest see recalibrate see where they are from point a to point b and also to use that information to basically like plot an even more powerful course forward mm -hmm. so that's coming gotcha. yeah and that's that's the evolution you know we're a company that um we we're not i, I can tell you for ha having like you know i sit i was in a meeting right before you and i got on this call together uh, i'm in these meetings all the time and we're we're planning our future and, you know, much like how we led off this full conversation where the very first thing that you and I talked about today was that we need to evolve. We need to constantly adapt. We can't just dig a trench and plant a flag and defend that position. And that's the way that we're viewing this as Zoe is that we, we see it as our goal, our mission is personalized nutrition. And our current version of what we are providing is great, but we are continuing to evolve and do better. Yeah, it's exciting. And I, I imagine over the next 10 years, as wearables get more sophisticated and convenient and available, that that might open up you know, whole, whole new avenues of data. I think it will, but let me, let me forewarn people a little bit about that, because I do think that it's important for people to understand one of the big trends in biohacking has been blood sugar monitoring. And it kind of comes back to Howie, the conversation that you and I were having earlier about um, if you only prioritized pain and nothing else, it would lead you towards, towards some poor choices. 
Well, if mm-hmm. you only prioritize blood sugar and nothing else, it will lead you to some poor choices. Because uh-huh. first of all, blood sugar is not the only measure of human health. And second of all, lowering your blood sugar when your blood sugar is already normal in the first place is not something that we can say improves your health. And that's what Mm -hmm. this sort of biohacking is getting people to do. And it's problematic because what they're doing, Howie, if you look at it, is they will replace uh, healthy carbohydrate-rich foods, which may increase your blood sugar, but not in an abnormal or negative way. And they are replacing those with you know, foods that do not contain carbohydrates, like animal products, mm-hmm. which are not associated with longevity and associated with multiple different diseases, including heart disease and cancer, are top two killers. So again, like we have to um, be smart and conscious consumers, and I will do my part and my best to use what I know and how I see things and share it publicly so that you can hear my opinion like you are right now on these types of things and make smart choices. How is this different than Zoe? So with Zoe, we're not just giving you a blood sugar monitor and then checking out. What we're doing is we're trying to collect the whole puzzle full of information so that we have a a bigger, more complete picture. And that includes your blood sugar, your blood lipids, includes your gut microbiome. And so all of that is being assembled together rather than just one part of that. That's the key. Gotcha. Yeah. So it's, um, I mean, you know, when, when your only tool is a uh, continuous glucose monitor, everything looks like diabetes, right? Yeah. And it's just, again, it's, I just think it's dangerous. This is not the only thing that matters for human health. And when you take a normal blood sugar and you make it lower, but still normal, there's no evidence that you have improved your health. But the problem is you may be making compromises in doing that, that are not in your best health interest. So one of your one of your jobs is to make sure that we're ta- we're taking a holistic look at uh, at all the at the variables that we know matter. Yeah, and 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 from my perspective, part of my responsibility as a medical doctor is using my education to see these things and call them out when they exist. Um, because mm-hmm. you know, to the layperson, they may not see that, and it's not that's not their fault is that they don't have the education to f- fully see that picture and understand that. So you've been with, with Zoe for a couple of months now. I actually was on the scientific advisory board starting in uh, 2020 and mm-hmm. from the scientific advisory board it matured into this new position as their U S medical director. And that is something that has been new in the last few months. Yes. Okay. Awesome. And it's, and it's working for your lifestyle. You're, happy, you can spend time where you need to? Yeah, because part of it is that I I am not full-time at Zoe. So I'm not full-time. They're not asking me to move to London. Um, You know, I basically, I work from home and there's flexibility. And, um, you know, the majority of my time actually is spent on things like, you know, promoting my new book or writing a new book or doing a course, things like this. So um, mm-hmm. so it's something that fits well with everything for me. Awesome. Awesome. Well, you, you seem happy and relaxed and, you know, in preparation for this call, I looked at our, our two past conversations and, you know, you get younger looking and healthier looking every time we talk. So it's, it's starting to piss me off. <laughs> well, you look, you, you don't, you certainly are not aging either, my friend. So um, you know, I think that's the power of, uh, it's the power of plants in a lot of ways is that, you know, you, you see these anti-aging experts and it's quite fascinating because there's a lot of people in the biohacking world. They will not listen to me, no matter what I say, they will not uh-huh. listen to me, but they will listen to David Sinclair because David Sinclair is the, you know, uh, aging and longevity biohacker. And he's saying eat more plants. Well, why? Well, because they contain polyphenols. Well, shocking. That's good for the gut microbiome. It's the same thing I'm saying. Uh huh. Right. So, um, you know, if you can't if you can't find you know metformin and resveratrol and and all the uh, the new molecules, at least you can listen to him on plants. 
Well, the resveratrol comes from plants. It's a polyphenol. That's the origin. Now we can isolate it. We can withdraw it and remove it, but then we're w- withdrawing and removing it from the fiber. And you can find, and resveratrol is way more than red wine, by the way. Um, and it's more than red grapes. I mean, you can find resveratrol in peanuts. The point is eat a variety of plants. It's the same thing I've always been saying. It's going all the way back to our podcast in 2018. Right. Well, um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of information out there and, a, and, most of it points in the same direction, which it has, which it has been doing for a long time. So I want to th- thank you for making fiber sexy, for you know, for for giving a rationale for you know, it's a it's a, a different kind of rationale. It's very um, holistic and organic. Like like your writing just makes a lot. I think I told you when when I first read Fiber Fuel, it was like I didn't want to read another effing book about plant based nutrition. <laughs> Because they were all so similar, and yours was just different, and it adds so much depth and nuance and and joy to the to the movement. So, I, you know, again, thank you for this for this new book. I do want to say the um, Mexican hot chocolate brownies are unbelievable. With with the top ingredient, by the way, being black beans, which is a beautiful thing. That you could have an unbelievable brownie, you, and the you, number one ingredient is a black bean. I did not tell my family that when I made it for them. And they're, you know, they're used to me making like weird shit like that, that resembles desserts. And they're like, well, this one's really good. And I'm like, ha, black beans. Suck us. Well, it's kind of like I, <laughs> you know, I have these two protocols built into the new cookbook. One is low FODMAP. One is low histamine. And, you know, the amazing thing is that like I could, you know, I could serve people um, like a mango burrito bowl or a gato gato bowl or, um, beet risotto or, uh, like ginger garlic, uh, I'm sorry, ginger, uh, uh, garlic noodles with broccoli. Right. And so like, there's all these delicious meals. And if I didn't tell you they were low histamine, you would never know. And that's like the thing that makes me very proud of the book is that I could have people over for dinner serve them a delicious meal they would rave about it and then when it's yep. over i'd be like yeah. and guess what it's low histamine gotcha suckers yep yep i also i made the sesame broccoli noodles i i had assumed that there was a typo because it only it said four garlic cloves rather than 12 so i i you know i adapted it for my needs ah that's amazing i'm sure you smelled lovely after that <laughs> yeah well you know keep keep away COVID and vampires that way so yeah. Oh, garlic is the best. Love it so much. So Dr. B, well, thank you so much. Um, we, did, we didn't reach the, uh, the rich roll three hour mark, but uh, again, people you know, should go listen to that one as well, because you dropped a lot of amazing truth bombs with, with Rich. And I so appreciate your, your loyalty to, uh, to me and to the podcast, because I know you've you're you're a big star now, and you still come back, and we have conversations, and it means it means a lot to me. So I know that you have, you know, lots of huge media opportunities, and I'm really happy that we're we're still in communication and and still um, pushing the boulder up the hill together. I mean, I don't really feel like anything changed, to be honest with you. I realize that I understand what you're saying. <laughs> I understand what you're saying, but I am the same guy. And, you know, I'm going to be, as soon as we're off this call, I'm going to go downstairs and change a diaper and, you know, see what's going on with my five-year-old son who was a little upset earlier. And, you know, look, uh, I'm just here doing my best. And I think that's what we're all just trying to do. Right. So, yeah. Well, you know, you, I don't think you grow your social media to almost half a million on Instagram and, and everywhere else by being otherwise. I think, you know, your, your superpower is just kindness and humility and curiosity and, and the desire to serve. And I think, I think that, that trumps a lot of, you know, social media strategies that I've seen and been pitched. So, um, it's, it's an honor to, uh, to, to continue to be in, uh, in relationship with you. Well, it's my pleasure for, uh, being friends and and having and coming on your show, Howie, I really do appreciate it. So, and thank you again. Uh, and where should people find you if they're uh, if they don't yet follow you? Um, if it, so, my website is theplantfedgut.com. 
And by the way, at theplantfedgut.com, you can find, if you get the new book, there's bonus assets. You can download those. Um, you can find all the references. My new cookbook has over 400 references, which I'm convinced may be a new world record for a cookbook. <laughs> and seriously, I, I'm not aware that any cookbook has that many. And, um, uh, and I have an email newsletter that people really seem to enjoy. And, you know, cause one of the big challenges is that obviously we're taking on nuanced topics and I want to break down that nuance. It's hard for me to do that on social media. So, uh, mm -hmm. when something big and new happens, I like to email my list and that's where that happens. So you can also find me on social media, both Instagram and Facebook at the gut health MD. Uh, my new book is the fiber fields cookbook. My first book is fiber fields. You don't have to read fiber field in, in order to do the fiber fields cookbook. Um, the first chapter really sort of sets the stage and gives you the primer that you need. But that being said, like, I, I do think that many people who do the new cookbook, you'll probably become curious and then go back and do the first one. They're, they're both well worth people's time. So, uh, not, not, you know, not, not only are they instructive and useful, they're also fun. They're, 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 they're easy reads. You have a, a, a breezy and welcoming tone. And so it's not, you know, it's, it's not a colonoscopy to read this book. <laughs> Let's not be vilifying colonoscopy. We already have enough trouble with getting people to get their colon cancer screenings. But no, I just, you know, right. Oops. I, right. Oops. I want to write a book. Uh, I want to write a book that I would enjoy reading myself. So stale, boring well, you, you medical know, you, you, vernacular you, is not the type of book that I want to read myself. So, no, well, you've done it twice, and so I, I, I thank you for each of those, and uh, and thanks again for all the work you do, and for uh, oh, and uh, where do people find Zoe? Because it's not just Zoe.com, right? I'm right. Oh yeah, yeah. So uh, the Zoe is joinzoe.com, and if you go there, by the way, if you want to learn more about Zoe, I have a completely free resource on the front of my website, theplantfedgut.com. And it's really intended to kind of okay. like let people okay. understand more about what Zoe is and how it works. Um, but if you go to joinzoe.com and you, and you do slash Dr. B, then uh -huh. you will uh -huh. um, go to a page that actually gives you a code to save 10%. And uh, I received no, like, uh, I'm not receiving money if you do that, but you are saving 10% by doing that. So you might as well keep the money in your pocket. Very good. And then, yeah, people can then just apply it to my Patreon at 10%. There we 10%. go. Perfect. That works out pretty well. So, and one thing I'll say real quick, uh, Howard, is that um, Zoe has these muffins that people eat. And one of the things about the muffins is that they are standardized and they were developed all the way back in 2017 as a part of the clinical trial. So it's kind of like high fat, high fiber, high sugar three different muffins and they allow us to compare my results to your results and have mm -hmm. like a mm -hmm. standard meal. All right. Um, the, the current rendition of the muffins are not vegan just so everyone knows. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Um, I think they can, can, I think they include dairy and not eggs. I think that's what it is, but I might be wrong about that. But the point is they are definitely not vegan as they currently stand, but we have realized you know, for years, honestly, that this was something that needed to be corrected. The challenge is you don't just change the formula because you have like all of this data going back to our original clinical trials. And yeah. if you change the yeah. formula, you would have to discard that. So what we're doing is we are actually going through actually quite a laborious process to recreate a vegan version. And it is coming and we are close, meaning like we are okay. taste testing close. Okay. So, uh -huh. um, uh -huh. so for those who are vegan and they, and they want something that is a vegan standard meal, just wait. And if you sign up for my email list, I will let you know when it's available. It's coming. Great. Great. Or, you know, the, for, we can, we can do some of the sort of ethically ambiguous thing with, if a, if a company comes out with, you know, lab cultured milk in, in the meantime. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. All right. Well, th yeah, thanks for, thanks for letting us know about that. And uh, look, look forward to hearing about that and giving it a try. Bye. All right. Sounds great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you again, Howard. Great to see you. A pleasure. Talk a to pleasure. you later. Talk to you later.